hey, happy Friday. If going into the weekend you decide what you need is a cautionary tale to remind you what happens if you workshop a play without either a director, a stage manager, or a dramaturg, don't worry, A Haunting on the Hill by Elizabeth Hand has you covered. Because honestly, the scariest thing in this Shirley Jackson estate approved official Return to Hill House is the workshopping process. Now, I have read the original Shirley Jackson novel, but it has been a number of years, and I went in originally worried that that was going to be an issue, but I do think that that was good in the same way that when I was originally working on an adaptation of Alias Grace with my mentor who was adapting it for the stage, I was originally asked not to read the book so that I could see if the play stood on its own feet, and apologies, a lot of my theatrical kind of dramaturgy analysis is going to slip into this book because it bled so much into the narrative. I really was focused on the play in this book in a lot of ways, but we will circle back to that. So while I originally felt kind of guilty for only having the kind of emotional imprint of that original novel, I've said it before and I'll say it again, I am a scaredy pants. So approaching The Haunting of Hill House, Shirley Jackson's original, was a little bit nerve-wracking for me initially because I kind of held it up as this kind of epitome of the Haunted House novel, but kind of looking at that novel, it's much more of a kind of psychological breakdown as much as anything. It has those hints of the gothic that I love so much that we also get in Jackson's work like we have always lived in the castle. So there's a lot of nuance and weight to Hill House, and that is going to carry into its official kind of follow-up, and that this has been approved by the estate as an official follow-up, and that carries a lot of baggage and a lot of weight. And unfortunately, I do think this book kind of sat under that and I wanted it to succeed so badly especially because of the theatrical angle and so it really needed to take the house and make it its own and in some ways it did because this house felt so much different than the house that I had these kind of vague outline recollections of in the first book. It also kind of focused in on a lore and a history that was from the 80s rather than even what we saw in the first book. I caught as a reader like one specific echo of the original Original novel. I'm sure there were more Easter eggs littered throughout that I missed. I caught something with Amanda, our kind of disgraced actor, searching for a second chance in this new work. But if you caught other references to the original novel, I would love for you to share those below. So the history of the house did feel very sequel-esque in that it took up this new lore and tried to really establish us in this new history. And yet the house itself, while changing and reconfiguring, never felt fully formed. And obviously with this more psychological bend, some of it is supposed to be amorphous and a little bit ambiguous. And there were these real emotional wells with these characters, insecurities, backstories, that felt very established for a purpose, and then that purpose never came to fruition. Because here we have a group of creatives centered around Holly, a playwright who was once a kind of shining star, a shining up-and-comer, 30 under 30, and her breakout play was revealed that she kind of stole the life story of someone else. A piece of history that I thought was going to play much more significantly in the climax of this book than it did. And so since then she has settled into a day job and is kind of in theatrical survival mode, which the book does kind of touch on the realities of being a theatrical artist in the modern moment, but never completely. Enough that I buy it that I'm there, especially with lines like, Holly was one of those people so practiced at self-delusion that it had become as natural as smiling. A lot of theater people were like that and nearly all the successful ones. And so at the opening of this book, she is on a hiatus from her job because she has kind of come in to this windfall of creative inspiration after finding this old manuscript at a rubbish sale. And she is now writing a play about a witch set directly kind of after Shakespeare. My theater history in relation to this novel is admittedly a little lackluster in that I didn't go research anything related to potential real things of this play and just kind of let it live and breathe within the story. But with that, we are very distinctly entering the idea of witchcraft into this narrative. And so Holly ends up renting Hill House for a two-week workshop. Again, without a director, which I will give credit where credit is due, the director backed out of this retreat, couldn't get away for the two weeks. So there was supposed to be a director. But again, there also wasn't a stage manager or a dramaturg. Just kind of anyone to rein in these creative egos just a little bit. But at the same time, we do need these egos to run a little rampant narratively. But Holly ends up going to this house with her girlfriend, Nisa, who is writing the 
music for the play and she is incorporating these kind of modernized murder ballads or she is adapting these murder ballads to fit within the narrative. She tells a character at one point, have you heard of Hadestown? So it gives us a very kind of distinctive idea of how the music is going to weave in and out of the story. And honestly, is the most compelling part. And there is this kind of friction in that Holly has this grant for this play. She has kind of come in to this kind of creative appreciation again, where she is being seen and recognized for her creative impulse. And she is really holding on to that, this idea that this grant is for her work and her play. And yet we keep having this kind of talk of we, especially with Nisa, as she is introducing her music into the script. And there was this idea that the reading committee for this grant, and I have read for many a developmental project, so I do have an idea of what that process may look like. That the music wasn't part of the script that was submitted, but she had mentioned it. And if I was reading a play for development, I would be incredibly interested in that. The idea of this play within the book was incredibly interesting to me. I'm interested in witchcraft. I'm interested in the supernatural on stage. I'm interested in the kind of feminist angle to it. This idea of the devil as a dog and the kind of devil's bargain of it all, the theatricality of that, the introduction of music and these murder ballads and the way it's going to shape the story. I have in fact worked on a play that featured a murder ballad, again, Alias Grace. And so there is this kind of creative warring at the heart of this. We've got the tensions between Holly and Nisa that are further complicated by their personal relationship. And then you've got Holly's best friend, Stevie, who is coming in to play the devil. And he is also a sound designer. And the way that sound design was playing such a pivotal role in this production was incredibly interesting to me. It also becomes important in the exploration of Hill House because now you have this vehicle through sound where you can kind of explore the shifting and the morphing of reality and whether we are perceiving what is real in a new way. And with that, the idea of sound and communicating sound through text is incredibly important in this book, both through Stevie's sound design and through Nisa's singing. I do think it is somewhat successful. And then there is an additional layer of tension and secrets because we come to find out that there is something that has happened between Nisa and Stevie that they are keeping from Holly. And so this secret is kind of looming over everything as well. And then we have the introduction of Amanda, who is kind of the outsider within this group. And that plays into her perceptions in the house as well. And she is an aging, really iconic actress who had had a scandal many years back that kind of dimmed her light. And she is viewing this role as Elizabeth, this witch, as a kind of comeback for her. And so all of these characters have a lot writing on this play and the success of this play. And this plays into their desire to stay in this house, despite the fact that everyone around the house is telling them they need to leave, despite the fact that they were rented the house in the first place. But there is a housekeeper that comes in that is basically warning them at every move that they need to leave. There's a woman who lives in a trailer or a double wide, not really clear exactly what, toward the end of the property or on the outskirts, who considers herself someone who watches over the house, who Holly's first interaction with was her wielding a knife when Holly drove up and first saw the house on a kind of morning jaunt. And then there are these threatening large rabbits that morph. Listen, I never figured out the rabbits. The rabbits just never made sense to me. And they were important because they were like on every chapter introduction. There was an element of the rabbits where I as a reader have trouble kind of removing my thoughts about rabbits in the kind of weird from Bunny. And then there was talk about mushrooms as well in a way where I had another book that I'm not gonna say because it would potentially spoil something in the book for you that I was also like, oh, it's hard for me not to think of that, especially because it is in a similar kind of gothic genre and because both feel so different from how we first experienced the house but we really seem to be playing on this idea of witchcraft. And so this idea of the rabbits potentially as familiars, which even the characters mention as an idea. And before I do kind of indulge myself in a little bit of a tangent regarding the play within the book here, I do want to talk a little bit about the structure. Now, the opening line is not a mirror of the original's opening line in any way, nor are we kind of coming back 80 years after, as the 80 years are talked about in the original book. Granted, if we were coming back 80 years after, we would have had to wait another seven years. Though at this point, I don't know that this book accomplishes something that wouldn't have been worth a wait of another seven years. In addition to that, we have very short, kind of choppy chapters here, which both make me think of like shorter play scenes where we seem to be really going toward action, but at the same time are very reflective. And we're not necessarily 
necessarily forwarding any specific action here. So it's not the same kind of dramatic structure as a play by any means, but it's hard for me not to compare structurally because theatrical craft is so central to the idea of this book. What did strike me is that it seemed to be this kind of jumbling of perception and what each character was kind of perceiving through their own lens. However, not even this was completely consistent because with Holly we got things through the first person and through everyone else we were in the third, but I didn't necessarily feel like Holly was our center by any means more than the others. Yes, she was the kind of narrative pulse, the kind of forward momentum, but she started to get kind of lost in the narrative as we moved further because she was no longer the most interesting and the fact that the backstories of these characters characters weren't really carrying us through didn't help. They were of course hinted at and we saw them as motivation and the reason certain characters potentially were acting certain ways, but they never really were grappled with in their full depth. There were the hints of the house kind of taking advantage of this, for instance with Amanda who is kind of really concerned about perception of her, especially as an artist and her craft and her legacy. She thinks that she is hearing the other artists in this house kind of snickering about her or talking behind her back whispering and so it's playing on her insecurities there and there are other examples of that for sure but at the same time none of them start to feel heightened enough and because the idea of the haunting of the house doesn't feel distinct enough it never really builds the full tension for that for me and I don't need it to have like one coherent through line in the sense of how the house is behaving but I think that there was an attempt to have these incredibly individual experiences experiences for these characters, the way the house is really separating them, especially contrasted with an endeavor that they are kind of joined together for that really is supposed to be this kind of communal experience. Workshopping a play is a lot of give and take and in a scenario like this all parts of the creative team really do have a voice in the room in some ways. Now granted the playwright has the last say. Their like is mentioned in the book, the one that's going to go off and rewrite pages at the end of the reading at the end of the night, but there still is this kind of sense of community that is created and so then we are contrasting that with all of these like very personal stories, personal secrets, and the way the house is trying to exploit that and separate them in so many ways. At least I think that was the intent and I do think that some of it was supposed to be ambiguous and open-ended in the sense that it was supposed to allow us to come to our own conclusions, but I don't think anything was strong enough in its kind of building to allow us to do that. Speaking of which, the play within this book, and subsequently also the dang murder ballads. Now maybe if I knew the tune of these murder ballads off the top of my head, it would mean more to me to see them laid out on the page so often, but I didn't. And on one hand, I do think it was an attempt to have this kind of musicality, to have this sense of sound portrayed through the pages, much in the way that when I was in college, we watched the movie Perfume based on the book to talk about how you can make design choices that kind of elicit the idea of smell when through design you can't make an audience smell something specific. Now we're not talking about the fancy movie theaters here. And so on one hand, I kind of got it. I got why we had so much of this, but then also we had so much of this text from the play, which was also written kind of mimicking Shakespearean Jacobian language in a way that drove me nuts because it felt very self-involved, especially when the characters were always talking about how revolutionary this reading was and how they'd found such interesting things in the text over the reading and just the language around it, which yes, you have to hype up your project while you're in it. You have to be excited about it, but the language didn't work for me. I didn't understand what this play was saying that had a distinct voice, that had a distinct angle. It felt very surface level to me and the language felt very self-indulgent. This was further reflected by especially a man Amanda's use of comparing this character Elizabeth to Medea, which I get it, especially if you are an actor, you're comparing characters on an epic scale. But there seemed to be this sense of approaching this character as a classic and not really approaching this idea of why this play why here, why now, and how and what it is communicating to a modern audience. Rather, it seemed very enamored of itself. And sure, this may feel kind of unfair for a fictional play that is at its heart a narrative device, but it is used so frequently in the text, and we get the dialogue of the play so frequently in the text, and I'm going to be completely blunt and honest here. 
I did not care about that dialogue. I was more interested in the kind of workshop process, the kind of inner dynamic of this group. Rather, that dialogue seemed to be there to kind of further this idea of witches, which was further kind of explored with the women associated with the house, or at least that Holly interacted with in relation to the house. And this is of note because of the idea of threes. And so we have the woman protecting on the outskirts, and then who turned out to be her niece, which is the housekeeper, and the woman who originally rented them the house. And so even the characters in the book start to wonder about the potential of them being witches. And then once you have this idea of three, you are kind of introducing the idea of the maiden, the mother, and the crone, even though it's never mentioned one time in the text. And this just felt like it further kind of convoluted the idea of the house. And then on top of this, we have the kind of history of whatever had happened in the 80s. And I liked the idea of this house just kind of sucking and pulling from everyone and this kind of compounding malevolence. And yet it never really feels like the narrative decides what it wants to be. And I like the idea of leaving something open-ended, leaving something open to the perception of the reader, the idea that it could be completely different for each character's experience because we're exploring the inner psyches of these people and ourselves in some ways, but that is so, so hard to accomplish. And I don't think that this was nuanced or deft enough in that, or always a possibility as well. I as a reader just wasn't smart enough to pick up on it. So I guess in conclusion, I will read you the little bit I wrote on Goodreads about this, which hopefully kind of consolidates some of these ideas into something a little bit more digestible, not necessarily more coherent, but I'm not the one writing the book. So I recognize that this is kind of rambling and all over the place. So I wrote, this has so much potential, but ultimately fell flat for me. And while I was so ready to be on board with the play workshop conceit, the play within the story offered nothing to the narrative itself. But we heard about it, or lines from it enough, that I was ready to start dramaturging the made-up play. It needed one. Maybe Hill House was the ultimate dramaturg, and it's an exploration of the cost of creativity. On top of that, so many pieces of the characters felt underdeveloped or never properly resolved. While it has been a while since I read the original Hill House, this didn't feel like the same place. That being said, I also was ready for a hand to make Hill House her own, like we tell playwrights adapting works for the stage. But it never fully formed, nor did it truly feel like the house played on the psyches and insecurities right for the full exploration of the characters. The narrative of the house itself, especially when mixed with the witchcraft in the play, felt convoluted. There is admittedly the possibility of references to the original that I missed. I did pick up one echo. I have to believe there was an attempt to keep things open-ended and ambiguous that just ended up feeling more half-baked. Moral of the story, don't workshop a play without a director, stage manager, or dramaturg, especially in a malevolent house. But also what was with the rabbits? What am I missing? So that's ultimately where I kind of landed. I will admit I did go out and buy this because I didn't want to wait for my library hold to come in anymore because I really wanted to read it. And I kind of wish I had just stayed on the hold list at the library. I mean, hardcovers are like 30 bucks now. Yeah, this is a $30 hardcover. And while I did get my 10% off that I earned on Indie Bookstore Day, that is still quite a lot of money on something I didn't end up loving. So I don't know. If you have read this, I would be really interested to hear your thoughts. I wanted to love this so, so much. And it's still read very quickly, especially because of the construction of the chapters, how they were short and punchy. But ultimately, they didn't really feel like they led up to anything that really crescendoed in a way that made the payoff worth it. So let me know what you're thinking. As always, thank you for hanging out and listening to my thoughts. Like and subscribe if you feel like it. Most importantly, read something good. And yeah, bye.